Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, I hope that everybody who is joining us on the live stream can also hear us. Uh, if you can't, please do type in something and let us know. But we did test it and it should be working. So I'm very excited to welcome you all here today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce USJETAA, the US Jet Program Alumni Association. We're a national nonprofit organization that supports Jet alumni, uh, both the Jet alumni chapters, 19 across the United States, which are entirely volunteer, volunteer run, but also individual Jet alumni. And we do programs like this to uh, further US Japan relations. Um, if you're not familiar with the JET program, the Japan Exchange and Teaching program, it's a wonderful program that hires college graduates to go live and work in Japan for up to five years, either as an assistant language teacher or as a coordinator for international relations where they are working in a local government office, tourism, or doing translation, that type of thing. So the purpose of the town hall tonight, and really our town halls in general, is that we have alumni across the country. Uh, 36,000 plus at the last count, and they don't always have access to really great programs around U.S.-Japan relations the way that we do here in Washington, D.C. So in addition to everybody who's sitting here in the room right now, we have people who have tuned in online for the live stream who are joining us tonight and who may watch this on the recording later. So we want to really share interesting topics related to U.S.-Japan relations with as many people as we can all across the United States. So just to briefly touch on the format of the event, we will have a wonderful panel with our speakers who, to our left, which you have their bios there in your handout, but we will also get an introduction from them soon. After the moderated discussion, we will be taking questions, both from the people here in this room, but also online, which I will be moderating uh, through our online portal. We will try to alternate between online question and in-person question. So before I turn this over to my colleague at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, I would like to introduce a few notable people who are here tonight. Um, not quite present, but soon to be here is Dr. Akimoto, the chairman and president of Sasakawa USA, and he's going to walk in the door any minute now. We also have Kazuo Kato, director of programs and, and administration over there, um, also from Sasakawa USA. Um, I would like to introduce Paige Cottingham Streeter, who is over here, the executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission, but also the board chair of US JDA. Um, and Carlos Bacara, who is the Associate Vice President for Government Relations. I'm not sure he's in the room right now, but you probably saw him wandering around. And he's based here in this uh, FIU and DC office. Lastly, I would also like to say we have some representation from the Embassy of Japan. And I'd like to point out Kotaro Oe, the ed Education Attaché. We're very, very excited that these uh, wonderful people could join us, but also we're really happy about everybody being here tonight. Thank you so much for coming out and giving your weeknight to us. Now I'm going to turn it over to Joy Champalu. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief because I am not the highlight, thankfully, of tonight's event. Um, it's our wonderful speakers on to the left of me, but so my name is Joy Champalu. I'm the program officer at Saskawa Peace Foundation USA. So Saskawa USA is based here in Washington DC. We're a nonprofit focused exclusively on strengthening US-Japan relations. And we essentially have a lot of programs and activities dedicated to understanding US-Japan relations in the United States through programs that, and activities that examine the relationship in a regional and global context. And so why does this relate to JET alumni? Well, for Sasko USA, it's hard for us to say that we are dedicated to strengthening US-Japan relations and not to acknowledge the wide, vast 36,000 JET alumni um, that, rep that are Americans that represent, um, Americans that have in-depth and nu nuanced understanding of Japan. And so Sasko Peace Foundation USA several years ago partnered up with USJDA to launch a series of um, events and a mini grant program that focuses, um, that engages JET alumni across the United States and helps them 
uh, build relationships with their local communities and host events that feature different sorts of issues um, and highlighting um, on different aspects of the U.S.-Japan relationship. So tonight is our second, um, hopefully, annual U.S.-Japan town hall event. Uh, thankfully, we've this is also the second time that we've had this event held here at um, the beautiful um, uh, space, uh, Florida International University in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we'll have another great discussion tonight. Um, and that's all from my end. I'm going to hand over the microphone now to Eric Feldman from FIU. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Good evening, everyone. As Joy said, my name is Eric. I'm the associate director of this uh, great uh, place that you are all visiting tonight, FIU in DC. And it is such a pleasure to host all of you here. Um, if you're not familiar, FIU is Miami's public research university and also happens to be the fourth largest university in the US with 58,000 students. But rather than bragging about our size, I wanted to hone in on the uh, part of what we do that would appeal to all of you, which is our global focus. So um, our curriculum is known as Global Learning for Global Citizenship, where every single undergraduate student at FIU takes courses and engages in activities that um, get at global awareness, perspective, and engagement. Um, that is not just, oh, here's this one class that every student takes. There are uh, over 200 global learning courses. They're across the majors. They're nursing global learning courses, hospitality, criminal justice, et cetera. And in fact, due to these uh, um, efforts, just this year that just ended, 2019, FIU was awarded the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Gold Award for Global Learning Research um, and Engagement. On the research front, and research is a big mission of what we do here in Washington. This space is used for great um, idea exchanges like tonight. It is also a home for our 100 interns that intern in Washington every year, um, but it is also our research advocacy operation. Uh, FIU has many researchers that engage in global issues like sea level rise and coastal resilience, and it's from here in Washington that we make sure that our South Florida congressional delegation and other uh, key committees um, know and are able to support what FIU is doing in these globally impactful uh, areas. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, for uh, tonight. Um, one of our hosts, Bahia Simons Lane, who you heard from first, is a uh, both alumna and current uh, graduate student at FIU. And both of us worked together previously in that global learning office, managing that global learning uh, curriculum uh, program. One other relevant guest that I'd like to point out tonight, since uh, the first two organizations had their uh, guests, a good friend of FIU is Annette Alvarez from Global Ties uh, Miami, uh, who does amazing work uh, with FIU every time there's an international visitor leadership program going on uh, in Miami. If I can be of assistance with anything logistical, no matter how small, feel free to let me know. The restrooms are across from the elevators if you haven't been there yet. And there are some uh, fobs that you may need on our front desk, but if anything, just uh, flag me down and I am glad to help. Thank you so much for being here. Back to you, Bahia. Um, thank you, Eric. I am not even gonna go behind this podium because I'm not gonna talk. I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Maya Fisher, and she will give a great introduction and also introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Bahia. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Japan Town Hall. Um, to all of those of you who have joined us here in Washington, D.C., um, we're so glad, as they said, uh, that you gave us some of your time this evening. Uh, for those of you who are um, comfortably behind your computers, who are joining us by the internet, uh, welcome, um, and we hope that you enjoy this evening's uh, discussion. Uh, first, I want to thank the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA um, and US JEDAA uh, for organizing this discussion. Um, these are topics in the relationship that we don't often get a chance to uh, give voice and space to, and so we're really glad to have the opportunity. Um, and thank you to Florida International University in DC for hosting us in this beautiful space this evening. As Bahia mentioned, my name is Maya Fisher. Um, I am the Director of Education and Tomodachi Programs for the US Japan Council, a nonprofit based here in Washington, DC that supports um, and strengthens the US-Japan relationship through people-to-people -people connections. Um, and I will be serving as the moderator for this panel. Um, I am joined by my distinguished panelists. Um, to my left is Niharika Chiburjo, 
uh, who is the Associate Executive Director at the Japan United States Friendship Commission. Um, and Mr. David Francis, who is the Associate Director for Government Relations at the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. The topic of our town hall this evening is the Tokyo 2020 Olympics um, as a bridge to uh, U.S.-Japan relations. For many of us who are alumni of the JET program, we have literally been the bridges of cross-cultural mutual understanding between Japan and the United States. But 2020 is a big year. It's the year of the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympic Games. Tokyo is putting its best foot forward to welcome athletes and visitors from around the world to this premier international sporting event in just seven months. Don't mind to freak anybody out, but it's coming. It's now here. Um, the Olympics and Paralympics have the potential to introduce a whole new group of people to Japan and Japanese culture. Visitors to Japan will be able to see the sights, experience Japanese hospitality and culture firsthand. They will eat the delicious food and discover that they've always loved Japan, but just never knew it. Those watching on TV will see the short videos introducing Japanese culture and will consider traveling there in the future, or perhaps participating or creating local Japan-related events in their hometowns across the United States. The magic of sporting events like the games is that it creates opportunities for mutual understanding without the need of being a country expert or a foreign language specialist. And in this case, the energy and excitement of the games has created the space for new cross-cultural programs and partnerships that can introduce new faces and organizations to the US-Japan relationship. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're here to talk about this evening. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce my panelists. Um, I will introduce each of them separately. Um, they will give a little um, introduction about what they're doing and why they're here, um, and then we will move to the discussion. First, I'd like to introduce David Francis. You have his bio, um, and he is here representing the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. I would consider him to be an expert in the sports industry. He has a master's in sports management from Georgetown, where he's also taught courses in sports ethics. David has been working for the USOC for nearly a decade. He manages relationships with federal agencies and international stakeholders. He is the POC with US diplomatic missions. Although not a Japan person, David has supported international sports diplomacy programs, including the Thank You Japan Initiative. This will be his fifth Olympic Games that he has worked as part of the USOC. So, David, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, the work that you do broadly for the USOC, and the Ch Thank You Japan Initiative? Sure. <clears throat> and thank you, Maya, and thank you, everyone, for uh, having me tonight, and I'm looking forward to the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Just a little bit of background about myself. I'm the Associate Director of Government Relations for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee now, and I've been working for them for the last decade. And I've had the honor to work for the most, I would say, arguably the most well-known and largest National Olympic Committee in the world, representing and supporting some of the biggest sports names and household uh, names on the planet. And it's been a journey that it has taken me all over the world. Um, it's an opportunity that I never envisioned that I would ever have when I graduated from my undergraduate studies and then my graduate studies. Um, here in Washington, I'm part of a team that works to manage our relationships with our government stakeholders. That can be anything from working with Congress, the executive branch, um, various federal agencies and international stakeholders. I spent a lot of my time working on the international side of the house. And as Maya mentioned, I'm the main point of contact for dip US diplomatic missions abroad. Tokyo will be my fifth games. I've worked four, two summer, two winter. Um, I've had the honor of the last two games to actually live and work in the countries where the games have been held. So in 2016, I moved to Rio de Janeiro for seven months and I served as a liaison to the U.S. consulate 
uh, general in Rio de Janeiro. And then in 2018, I did something similar at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, where I spent three months there serving as a liaison. So it's been a very unique and wonderful journey. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I'm looking forward to doing again. Um, four months from now, I'm going to be leaving for Tokyo and spending the summer and spring there. So looking forward to the full cultural immersion. And so what I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about tonight is what we call our Thank You Japan campaign. And Thank You Japan, and actually it should be Origato Japan. I don't know why it's not um, translated into the native language, but I've, I've talked to my communications people about potentially <laughs> weaving that into the next version of it. Um, so one of the things that we like to do is prior to each games, we try to think about ways that we can foster bonds and relationships between our athletes and the host countries to where we're traveling to. So in working with our partners, Fleischmann Hilliard, which is an international communications firm, um, we put a lot of thought into creating a campaign that has three goals in mind. One, we wanna to contribute to the positive legacy of the Tokyo 2020 games. We wanna secondly, be able to say thank you to the people of Japan for hosting the world. And we don't want to just say that in voice. We want to actually have some action behind that. And thirdly, we want to contribute to the global community by um, sharing the uh, Olympic and Paralympic values. So think about respect. You think about uh, endurance, um, inclusiveness, all the different Olympic values that are out there. And so when we were working on this campaign, one of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure that it was authentic and it was relatable to the people of Japan. And so what does it look like? What we have created with is created is a nine month campaign that has Team USA athletes engaging with the people of Japan through various different activities, which are meaningful. And the purpose of is to drive um, mutual understanding and foster bonds. And so two things I wanna highlight before I get too much into the details is our relationship with Sentagaya City, which is a, uh, is a ward or a prefecture in Tokyo from what I understand. And Sentagaya City is the official hometown host city of Team USA in Tokyo. It is where we're going to put our high performance training center and for those who don't know what a high performance training center is, it's a place where the athletes can go when they're not staying in the visit, in the village, where they can go and they can train, they can get treatment, they can do sports nutrition, um, recovery, all the things that go into performing at a high elite level as an athlete. We're gonna do that at the Okura Sports Park, which is located in Sentagaya City. So through the Thank You, Jam uh, Thank you Japan campaign, we are engaging in several different activities in Sentagaya. We launched the campaign last fall, and it started with, uh, originally we brought four of our wheelchair rugby athletes to Senegai City to engage in a symposium on accessibility and to also do an accessibility tour of Senegai. And that was a good way to create dialogue and bring attention to the issues of accessibility in Japan. And then in November that uh, last year, we also, uh, brought over two of our high profile track and field athletes to launch. Um, there was a, a dedication of the new track and field facility at the Okura Sports Park, where our athletes engaged in a youth sports clinic with Japanese students from an elementary school. And it was an opportunity for the athletes to share best practices about how their, the, the values and the uh, different sort of um, lessons that they've learned from their sports careers translate off, to, off the field. And so all of this is just part of this great, uh, greater campaign that we are using to really connect to the people of Japan and the people of Tokyo. And one last thing that I want to mention is we're also looking to just connect from in a cultural aspect. The athletes, for the most part, when they travel to competitions around the world, they typically go to their hotel, they go to the venue, and then they're on a plane off to their next competition. Through Thank You Japan, we're giving the athletes the opportunity to really engage with Japanese culture. And so they're doing this in a relaxed atmosphere. And one of the cool things that I'll touch on in a little bit that we're doing is we recognize that animation, Japanese animation is something that is very popular in Japan. And so we're rolling out um, what we're calling Team USA Magna Comics. 
And so we partnered with local Japanese artists to design these comic strips that are going to green light U.S. athletes and Japanese athletes together engaging in heroic feats as they go about their days in Tokyo. So I think that's something cool that we're going to roll out pretty soon on our social media platforms. But again, it's a way for us to connect in a relatable way with the Japanese people. Interesting. Athletes manga comics. Manga. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think they'll be very popular. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that um, they, one of the kickoff events brought Paralympic athletes um, to Japan. And uh, in a place like Japan that just four years ago celebrated the passage of their um, anti-discrimination laws for people with disabilities, um, is what other kinds of inclusivity efforts um, are part of either the Thank You Japan initiative or the Olympics more broadly? Well, I would say that Tokyo and the Tokyo Organizing Committee has put a lot of thought and effort into figuring out how they could utilize technology to make Japan more accessible. Mm. And it, there is no doubt about it. Japan is more accessible in 2020 than it's ever been in its past. Mm -hmm. We've had, um, I mentioned the event that we did in Sentagaya City. We brought over Tatiana McFadden. Is anywhere in, a, in the room aware of who Tatiana McFadden is? Tatiana is one of the most decorated U.S. Paralympic athletes. She's a wheelchair track and field athlete. She is a 17-time uh, medal winner. She crushes the, she literally wins the New York and the Boston and the London Marathon every year. And one of the things that she mentioned on her visit to Sentagaya City in November was how accessible she has noticed that Japan and Tokyo is. Mm. She's not used to going to sports venues and seeing areas that have so much accessibility for uh, users, um, wheelchair users. So to answer your question, I think these games are being used by Japan in a way to really bring that conversation to the table to discuss how the United States has, uh, how we've struggled with our accessibility issues and then how Japan and the U.S. can foster a dialogue and discuss these issues and how we can utilize technology to move forward with them. That's great to hear. Um, and what would you say has been the response by the Japanese so far to the campaign? Well, you know, we just rolled it out in, in the fall, but I mean, thus far, I've had a lot of people come up to me um, and they mentioned that they're just so proud that we actually are using Sentagaya City as our home host training uh, base. And there's just like, there's a sense of pride to it. And there's a lot of appreciation that we are taking the time to really get to know the people of Japan. Um, and understand the values and the culture and the heritage that is there and that exists. Um, so talk to me in about two or three months when we start doing more <laughs> events, but thus far the, the, it's been a positive reception. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we'll come back as part of the discussion to follow up on this, but um, Thank You Japan is an initiative that explicitly tied to the games and that it involves athletes um, and the public. Um, but there are other efforts that have, that have found a space uh, made possible by the upcoming uh, 2020 Games. Um, and one of those programs uh, I will have a chance to talk about, and then I will turn it over to Niharika. Um, but uh, one of the programs that um, we work with, uh, with the Tomodachi Initiative uh, at the U.S. Japan Council um, is a new program that we have designed and are rolling out this year. Um, it's a collaboration with the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, um, and it is the Tomodachi U.S. Embassy Sports Leadership Program. Um, and the Tomodachi Initiative is a public-private partnership between the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo and the U.S. Japan Council, the organization for which I work. And we focus on cross-cultural leadership development of the next generation um, of youth in Japan and the United States. Um, and Sports is one of the areas um, in which, as I said before, you don't need language explicitly to be able to foster cross-cultural understanding and mutual understanding. Um, but one of the things that we focus on in Tomodachi is also leadership. So sports is an area 
um, that we see the uh, potential for growing leaders, um, particularly in Japan. And so this program uh, is focused on bringing Japanese college students who are studying sports, um, sports industry, business, athletics, to the United States um, as part of um, a learning program. And it is um, an extension of the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo's Go for Gold program. It was a public diplomacy initiative that they did um, and have been doing for about the last year and a half. And it was designed to help get people in Tokyo excited for the Olympics um, by introducing actually uh, U.S. athletes um, to young people uh, throughout the city. And what we wanted to do is, you know, we had garnered a whole bunch or they had garnered a whole bunch of um, goodwill, energy and excitement around that. Um, and wanted to extend that. And so we looked at um, the legacy of the games. What will be the legacy of the 2020 games? Um, and specifically looking at structural legacies. So much building and construction has happened around these Olympics. A brand new stadium, um, refurbishing old um, uh, housing for the athletes. Um, but there seems to be questions about what will happen to all of those structures afterwards. Where have they been built? Will they be integrated back into the communities where they've been built? How will they be used? Will they be used for other sporting events? Will they be used for other types of events? Um, and so it got me thinking about, okay, well, you know, where can we learn about or talk about or think about some of these things? Um, and so we actually looked to the LA 1984 Olympics. Uh, which is considered to be the most profitable modern day Olympics. Um, and we looked at some of their planning, um, some of the way that they've used the various venues and structures all throughout LA County, um, which is a huge <laughs> land area um, that involves a lot of places. And so we've thought, okay, well, if we can bring Japanese students who are studying this area, um, bring them to Los Angeles to help them to think about what ways and um, ways these venues have been used um, and the way that they've been thought about, maybe they can bring those ideas back to Japan. There's such potential for growth in the sports industry in Japan. Um, and so our program is a two-week program. It will bring Japanese college students to Los Angeles um, and New York. Um, and the focus will be on, in Los Angeles, looking at lessons learned from the 84 Olympics. And LA is also preparing for the 28 Olympics. So they're already in planning and organizing mode. Um, but looking at how the idea of entertainment districts um, and multi-use venues um, perhaps might be able to be brought back to Japan. In New York, they will be studying the broader sports business. Um, and thinking about and being exposed to different areas um, within sports. Not everybody can be athletes, not everybody can be coaches or managers, but there are so many more areas um, that are part of the industry, accounting, mental health, training, um, retail, other types. So exposing them to all of these ideas. Um, the whole goal is that um, when the Japanese come back, uh, we are hoping to convene um, some of the key stakeholders with the Tokyo Olympics in Japan in December of this year um, and give the participants an opportunity to propose some of their ideas, some of their learnings from this project uh, with the hope that the thinking that is starting to happen around what will happen after the end of August and September, um, that these places will still be able to be continued to be used. Um, they will be places of gathering and bringing people together around, whether it's sporting events, musical events, other community events and activities. Um, so that is just one other type of program uh, that this big event has allowed us um, to present. Um, or made possible. And we hope that it doesn't stop here. We're hoping that this is, continues, that it's not just a one year program um, and that we hope to uh, continue it. And 
excuse me, I misspoke about the title. Somebody's going to kill me if they're on the video. But um, it is the Tomodachi U.S. Embassy Go for Gold Sports Leadership Program. So I will, I apologize for the mistake. Um, but that is one. So sports, around sports management and leadership. Um, but we also have arts programs um, that have been able to be um, started around this pro, uh, the Olympics. So Niharika is a fellow JET alum. Um, she's the deputy agency head of the Japan US Friendship Commission, which is an independent federal agency. She runs grant program activities in public affairs, education and culture, management, manages their investment funds and actively liaises with the governments of the United States and Japan. The commission has, has a creative arts program that they are tweaking to leverage the history of the relationship between the modern Olympics and the arts in favor of fostering mutual understanding. Uh, so Niharika, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about this uh, U.S.-Japan Creative Artists Program? Okay, thank you, Maya, and um, thank you to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, to USJAA, and to FIU for having us here, and to my fellow panelists. I will start with a disclaimer. I am not a JET alum. I wanted to be on the JET program, <laughs> but um, that can tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in India, and I learned all my Japanese in India, and that's the fun fact of the evening. But um, I am the Associate um, Director of the Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission. As Maya mentioned, we're a federal agency. We're grant-making and we support U.S.-Japan relations and Japan studies. And our mission really is, you know, the people-to-people -people exchange came up, fostering mutual understanding came up, and that's, that's really the theme and that's what we do. Um, I am here today to tell you about the U.S.-Japan Creative Artists Program, which is a, a program that the commission has hosted um, for 42 years. We talked about new initiatives, new initiatives being rolled out, and in the true history of Japan, you know, being old and modern, I'm hearkening back to the history of this, um, this program that now we are really paying homage to the modern Olympics that many people don't realize from 1912 to 1948 included the arts as part of Olympic competition. I don't know how many people knew that. I didn't until about two years ago when our part, you don't get points. <laughs> uh, about two years ago, our um, partners in this US-Japan Creative Artists Program, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, Michael Orlov is here from the NEA, shout out to Mike. But um, they came to us saying, hey, did you know that arts were part of the Olympics. And um, Tokyo is hosting the Olympics in two years. We have a partnership already. We work on US-Japan Arts Exchange. Let's do something. And we said, yes, of course, we should do something. And, and so a program was created out of an existing program. So we already had this program where we would send US artists to Japan five U.S. artists are selected to go and spend time in Japan, three to six months, and learn about Japan, immerse themselves in Japanese culture, pursuing their art without any responsibility or reporting responsibility from our end to produce a work. Because we understand, and we will probably get to this later, but the, the work that we do is I call it like turning the Titanic. You start now and you see results maybe many years later. That's why we're not in construction. There's no instant gratification. So coming back to this point of we would send these artists to Japan, they would work on their art. And at some point, maybe 10 years later, they would create a work that was inspired by their time in Japan. This time we decided that we would have the artist apply as a US-Japan pair. So the American artists would have to find a partner in Japan that pursued similar art, and they would have to get together and spend a year producing a work of art that we will 
showcase in Tokyo during the Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games. So it's been a wonderful opportunity. We have five pairs of artists and we have had the opportunity to really showcase art and artists from different parts of Japan. So not just from the big cities, from Fukushima all the way down to Kobe. We have people from Oita, we have people from Tokyo. And so we are able to bring these artists together to create works of art that are murals, that's a dance performance, that's a musical performance infused with karate going on in the background. And, and we will be working with the Setagaya Art Museum to host some of these programs and, and other partners around the Tokyo area. So it's been a very interesting project that has brought, that is keeping us up at night, uh, working with the U.S. Embassy, working with the National Endowment for the Arts, our partners in Japan or the International House of Japan. Uh, we've met other partners along the way. And um, so for us, this is just a new way of people-to-people -people exchange of creating those new and special partnerships that we didn't have. The, the fact that I'm sitting here with Maya, who I've known for a while, but David, who I've never met, I think <laughs> partnerships are happening even as we speak. So um, I think I'll stop there and see what else you have to say. So actually, can I follow up on the partnerships yes. piece? Um, and David, you can answer this too in terms of what are some of the new partnerships? You mentioned NEA uh, that have come out of some of these new campaigns or programs um, that have, in some ways, if you think about it, sort of expanded the um, people who are participating in U.S.-Japan relations who aren't necessarily U.S.-Japan people. I think, I think for us, you know, NEA is a long, long-term partner of ours. But I think, you know, introducing Japan in a different way to my colleagues at the NEA who are old friends and have worked on this program with us. And, and I'm sure I'll call upon Michael Orlov later to share his experience working with us as well. But I think just if you're like me and you've studied Japan since you were 17 years old, that was only 10 years ago. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but you, you have this sense of, you know, knowing Japan in different capacities as you've gone through different iterations of your studies or your career. And then you get to see Japan through the eyes of somebody who doesn't know that they love Japan yet. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very different experience. It teaches you a lot about yourself. It teaches you how to rein it in as well and not try to tell them everything or, you know, no, you can't do this and make sure your business card is, you know, don't put it in your back pocket and things like that. But, but just, just going through that experience of with, with my colleagues who are experts in their own right in their own field and experts in European cultures and countries, but Japan is new to them. I think just opening that up, as a new world has been a very, very interesting experience for me personally. And David, for you, for the Thank You Japan campaign, it's, some of it is, you know, the athletes get something out of it and then the host community people get something out of it as well. Um, you mentioned uh, Setagaya is the partnership or the um, home host for the um, team. Are there other partnerships that have come out of this campaign? Yeah, for us, I would say, you know, one of the main partnerships is working very closely with the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Um, the Go for Goal campaign and Thank You Japan have a lot of symmetries. They're bringing athletes over as sports envoys who are participating in lots of different programs with school children, with individuals who are working on disaster relief in other parts of Japan. And so what we recognize is that if we're bringing athletes who are going to contribute to be part of our programs, why don't we work together and partner on some additional programming that we can use the Team USA brand um, to make some positive change. And then I would say just the people-people exchanges, athlete to athlete, 
um, our athletes are having the opportunity to meet people and then use their voice and use their platform as a way to connect with individuals. And I mentioned the disaster relief. That's one of the things that we are really trying to, well, in the end, I don't think we're going to be able to contribute as much as we want to, but we want to bring recognition to the efforts that the important work that our people do, are doing in these communities that were um, um, hit by the tsunamis and some of the other natural disasters. So I think after the games, there's going to be opportunities for our athletes to go out into further areas, in more distant areas from Tokyo, more broader than Tokyo. And mm -hmm definitely um, contribute to those efforts, whether it's just bringing recognition or encouraging people in those communities and the relief workers. Wow, that's great. So they will stay beyond the actual Olympics and the Paralympics? Um, well, it, it you know, depends on their schedules, mm -hmm. um, but I, would, I can envision that several athletes will return to Japan oh. when they have the opportunity to. Awesome. Um, and that actually brings up um, one of the, the points in terms of, um, you know, you're tweaking this longstanding program for this year. Uh, you know, the Thank You Japan initiative is for this Olympics. Um, and what do you see as the long-term contributions these programs are making in furthering mutual understanding in the U.S.-Japan relationship? Um, let's say long term, you know, Japan is going to have an opportunity to have the whole world arrive on their doorstep for two months. And so what that's going to do is it's going to expose the community and people to individuals of all walks of life, whether it's people of different national origin, sexual orientation, able body, disabled body. It's going to be an opportunity for the people of Japan to really connect and learn from people that are different from them. Um, Japan is, is in a place where it is, is starting to look more outward and inviting foreigners to come work in the country. Um, I think long term, just the ability to be exposed to so many, I mean, talking millions of people that are going to come to Japan. Um, during the time of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, that's going to be an opportunity that individuals are going to learn, be able to learn and develop stronger bonds with foreigners. And hopefully that can pay its way forward. Yark? I would, uh, I would echo that. And I would also say just, just that awareness that stems from that. And for those of us in the room who are tireless toilers toward U.S.-Japan relations, I think for us, it, it does afford this level of buoyancy to what we do where I don't really have to explain to friends and family what I do for a living without them understanding. Usually like, oh, you, you still do Japan stuff? And, well, I work for the government. Oh, what's public diplomacy? You know, that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it makes it easier to return Japan to the conversation and to build that awareness about Japan to have people who were not ever really interested in Japan just want to go to Japan because the Olympics are happening mm -hmm. there. And, and from a programmatic purpose, I think for, uh, for us, it, um, it's given us this opportunity to expand on an existing program and inject a freshness to it and bring in Japanese collaborators that we didn't ever have before or know before. And so I think at the very least, we have created 10 because we have five artists and they have, you know, they're Japanese collaborators. So I'm hoping at least 10 lasting relationships that ordinarily wouldn't have happened. And if, if we're able to do that, and, and this goes to the, the, the more emotional side of why we do what we do. If we can do that, I think that's a great thing. I would agree with that. And I think the, the, the investment or um, the long-term efforts in trying to foster um, 
greater exposure, um, greater mutual understanding um, between our two countries um, is for most of us in the room and online or people who've been involved, it's emotional. It is something that we're passionate about, that we wholeheartedly believe in, and that we often have to defend to people, why do we do it? Why are the investments worth it? Um, you know, what, in addition to what you both just said, what might you answer to somebody um, who isn't interested in Japan um, or maybe thinking about Japan um, or the United States, but why or how would you explain somebody why things like this are important? And it doesn't have to be a serious answer. It's be, <laughs> like I feel the tension in the room ratcheting yeah. up. <laughs> um, Olympism is a word that encompasses a lot of different adjectives. Um, togetherness, respect, um, inclusiveness. I, I think for someone who is thinking about going to Tokyo for the Olympics, um, I would say to them, you're going to be amongst the Olympic spirit. And it, it really is going to be embodied by everyone that is there from the fans to the athletes, to the volunteers. Um, it, by showing hands, has anyone in this uh, room been to an Olympic games? So some of you, so you, you get a sense of that environment, the atmosphere. Um, they're literally, it's, it's like being in, a major hub of an international airport, but individuals are not going to different gates. They're actually all going to the same gate. And you can have a, a collective conversation about various different issues. And everyone is literally there in this positive spirit and, and everything that the Olympics stand for as far as inclusiveness, diversity, respect, those things all come to the table. I have, um, I actually have a little bit of an anecdote. You know, I, I've been doing, studying Japan since I was 17 years old. And I worked, moved to the United States, went to graduate school, worked on US-Japan relations. I used to work for the Mansfield Foundation previously. And after that, I, I left for a bit and went to work for industry. I was working with, uh, multinational corporation on corporate sustainability and um, corporate social responsibility, which was a very focused early childhood interventions on behalf of the company where we were conducting literacy programs in very depressed communities in the United States. So Appalachian, Ohio, the South side of Chicago, inner city Detroit, and I did that for a period of time and then returned to the world of U.S. Japan, where I questioned. My, the first thing I did was we were going to Japan and there was talk about where the cherry blossom trees would be planted. And, and I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I was changing the world. I thought I was changing the world. And I, I've come back into this world that's my own and then... I don't know what I'm doing, what's my purpose? Mm -hmm. And I had an intern at the time who, who said to me, you have to remember you're preventing a war in the future. Mm -hmm. And that has stuck with me for the past five years that I've been with the commission. I'm not handing out books to little children or doing nutrition programs, but maybe I am preventing a war in the future. And, mm -hmm. and those are conversations that that we, you know, we, we remember, but we don't always think about because our work is such that it is, you don't see results every day. But the fact that I look like what I look like, I'm not American, I'm not Japanese, and I can sit here and talk to you about U.S.-Japan relations and what I do to, to promote peace and understanding between the United States and Japan, I think, stands on its own. So for me, again, you know, this becomes that you, anecdotal emotional part of the discussion. But when you, when you think about why you do what you do and how you got there, you realize that 
it does make a difference. The fact that it's a really cold night and there are so many people in this room, the fact that I can look out and say, yes, there are new faces here, but there are so many familiar, very reassuring faces who I've known and who've nurtured me in this community for so long and accepted me uh, for who I am. You know, I'm a student of Japanese. That's what I do. <laughs> and I'm a lifelong student of Japanese. And, if, and I'm happy to bring along whoever wants to come along. And it doesn't have to be through tra tra traditional Japan studies. If manga is what hooks you and brings you in, come along. You don't have to study Basho or, you know, the Heian <laughs> period. If you, if you saw a cartoon and you liked it, welcome to the world of U.S. Japan. <laughs> yes, well said. <laughs> um, Okay, so at this point, I think I would like to take a break from my questions and give people in the audiences, um, both here and virtually, an opportunity to um, ask questions so far. Um, we, I don't know where we're going to start. Are we going to start here or there? <laughs> Maybe give the online people a chance. Okay. They've been waiting. Well, so I have not yet had any questions come in online. So um, for those of you who are watching virtually, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A feature, which will be at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are in person, raise your hand in the traditional <laughs> manner and we will take your questions. Let's start with Paige. Thank you. Um, and this is a great panel and I'm really enjoying it for lots of reasons. I have a question for David um, because Japan is hosting this Olympics, and my understanding is as a result of that, there are some, and because of other reasons, there are some new games. And so karate is one, for example, one of our artists is interested in incorporating karate and music. And so I'm wondering about a little bit about that decision-making process of what gets included to be a new sport, um, and will that sport continue in the future, do you think? Or is it one time mm -hmm. only? Well, it actually depends. So the host country has uh, the ability to pick and choose and add new sports to the calendar for their host games. So you'll also notice that baseball and softball have been reintroduced to the Olympic games. Those sports are popular in Japan. So they decided to bring those back into the games. Um, whether that will move forward, um, that is just a question for what next organizing committee decides they want to do, which would be Paris and, or France in this, in this case. Um, a, some of it also relates on to what the IOC wants to feature as far as what gets ratings. Um, there are certain sports, the IOC is really changing the dynamic of the Olympic Games and they're shifting to these new, cooler, young hip sports. So you see sports like break dancing, rock mm -hmm. climbing, um, skateboarding, surfing, Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen these events at, um, I was in Lima for the, uh, actually I was in Buenos Aires for the Youth Olympic Games, and they featured those there, and it's exciting, it's electric. And so some of the decision making goes into what is going to resonate with the new movement of youth athletes. Mm -hmm. Next. All right, those of you online, please feel free to type in your questions and uh, we'll take another question from the audience here. Um, actually, please let me repeat it before you answer it, just in case everybody online can hear it. Any other questions in here? If you don't ask us questions, we're going to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Paige, go ahead. Um, so the other um, question that I had had a little bit um, to do with something that David spoke about, and I guess Maya referenced in her remark earlier about using the games as an opportunity to uh, introduce people to Japan and also think about how to use the structures later. And so I'm thinking many of us in this room and maybe online are part of organizations that do work with Japan. And so I'm wondering, has the Olympic Committee or some of the other organizations around thought about where we can pick up? where your work has left off. You're obviously helping to provide the games and present it to the world. But I know as a family member who's attended the Olympics, 
it's a big experience and can introduce people to Japan. So when they come back home to their countries, do you see a role for local, national organizations to maybe continue a little bit of the excitement that you described and talked about with regard to the country? So in summary, the question is, how do you see things continuing after the Olympics, either through use of the structures that exist there or after people return to their home countries or the United States? So one of the things that every um, Olympic organizing committee does at the end of the games is they transition to what is called as a legacy foundation or organization. And those organizations typically are tasked with driving the legacy of the current games. And so Maya may be able to speak to this in, in her work with LA84, um, but they develop a lot of different programming that allows the local communities to still engage and continue to live the Olympic values on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Um, another example here in the United States is, for example, is the Salt Lake City, Utah Foundation. They're, they're the legacy foundation from the 2002 um, Winter Olympic Games. Um, I'm trying to think of a number, but there are a host of different communities in towns around Japan which are hosting teams and athletes to do their own sort of host uh, training base camps. And I can see as a natural extension of once the Olympics and the Paralympic Games are over, that they want to continue to develop programming that they can utilize for all different uses, whether it's uh, increasing awareness about health and fitness, um, diversity and inclusion, as I mentioned earlier. But there's a lot of different ways that you can use the games as a catalyst to drive legacy. Maya, did you have anything to contribute to that? Um, I'm not familiar as much with sort of the specifics of what LA84 is doing around the Olympics, but I do know um, that they do a lot of um, local program in Los Angeles County um, for young people. Some of it sports related, some of it more community based. Um, we did have a meeting, they're doing a day of um, a sports day that they're trying to do throughout the United States, um, but they're also thinking of expanding them to countries like Japan, um, where communities of children, uh, young people can um, just sort of facilitate um, play because not everybody has the opportunity um, to play sports and kind of do um, some exchanges around um, what kind of sports are being played during that day of play. So um, that's just one example that they're currently developing. Um, but I do think this question about legacy and what people can do after they go back ties into what Bahia had talked about earlier and thinking about all of the um, JET alumni that we have around the United States. Um, 39, 39,000, 30 something. 30,000 plus, it's still a lot of people. Um, and you know, you think about um, a lot of us are parts of organizations that have regional offices or regional programs. Uh, and so I think in terms of carrying forward the momentum, um, this is when people can think about um, tapping into Japan America societies within regions. Uh, for us at the council, our members uh, within different regions. And so um, I know as organizations, most of us in the DC room here, do things regionally, this can be an opportunity to sort of think outside the box. Think about the types of programmings that people, even if they're just watching at home in Cincinnati or Tennessee, um, you know, they may be more likely to come out to a Sakura Matsuri or come out to um, a Taiko performance. And so just thinking about ways to tap into people um, who have been primed, if you will, by this Olympics, just throughout our local communities, just could be a way to, to elevate and increase visibility. Thank you. Now we're gonna take a question from online from Rose, who is actually watching from Japan right now. Ooh. Thank you. Um, so her question, uh, I think this is really for David uh, again. Will Los Angeles 2028 be looking at best practices from Tokyo 2020? For example, P 
PNG is collecting plastic to make podiums for the Olympics and precious metals from discarded smartphones are being used to make the Olympic medals. Additionally, will there be efforts in 2028 to engage Japanese athletes in a similar way as the Thank You Japan campaign? Um, to answer the first part of the question, absolutely. Um, there is what is called an observer program where um, future host cities, organizing committees send representatives, um, and they will send representatives to Tokyo to see exactly the different types of projects that um, Tokyo 20 or yeah, Tokyo 2020 has implemented. Um, I don't want to speak for uh, LA 2028 just because they're a, a separate organization. They're partners of ours, but they are very much future oriented in the sense that sustainability mm -hmm. and reusability of venues is something that they're really stressing for these games. Um, the IOC has, um, they have this agenda called, well, it's called Agenda 2020. They announced it in about four or five years ago. But the point of it was for future games, they don't want countries and cities building new venues. They want everything or at least 90% of the venues to be existing spaces. Or if you're going to create a new venue, they want it to be temporary, something that can be scaled down. So, for example, if you have a swimming stadium, um, that can host 25,000 people during the Olympic Games. They want the stands to be scaled down to, say, 2,000, so it could be used for a local community center down the road. So LA 2028 is focusing very much on keeping the games, uh, I don't know what their theme is, but it's definitely something that they're keeping in mind as far as reusability, um, focusing on... Uh, Eliminating waste. I think that's one thing you're going to see for every Olympic Games moving forward is we want to make sure that we're not wasting. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the Washington, D.C. audience? Okay, keep thinking about it. We're going to take another question from online. Um, the next question is, how can JET alumni be involved with the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, even if they aren't able to be there in person? It's kind of a tough question. Apply to the Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission for an internship. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we have several social media platforms on teamusa.org that um, if individuals want to engage in the Tokyo 2020 games, they can definitely um, visit our websites and see what opportunities that are out there. Otherwise, I would say there are probably, in LA is probably a good example of this, there's probably going to be a lot of activities taking place here at home in the United States during the Olympics. And so I would look to see wherever you're, wherever you are based to see what sort of community programming may be taking place. So that might be another opportunity for an alumni to participate in the games here locally. Um, I'm also going to add briefly, I have talked with some of the JET alumni associations who are planning to try to mobilize JET alumni across the United States to do watch parties of different Olympic games. So while I don't have any specific details about what that it's going to be like, please, um, you know, like our Facebook page or subscribe to our newsletter, become a member so that you can hear about it as soon as we start pushing that out through social media and announcing it. Also stay connected to your local JET alumni chapter um, because this is going to be something that we're going to push out across all of the 19 chapters. So while you can't actually work on the Olympics, it's a great way to get together with other JETs and kind of support the Olympics in 2020. Also, if I might add, that, yeah. coming back to the internship part, you know, Paige had mentioned where do, where does the USOC leave off and we pick up, and a way to be engaged in the Olympics in some way or another, and US-Japan relations is really to work with organizations, work on Maya's program, you know, be an intern with us or at the NEA or other US-Japan organizations that are doing programming that supports the Olympics in some way or the spirit of the Olympics in some way. So I think, you know, come talk to us and 
will get you engaged in the Olympics. Can I ask a question of the audience? Um, is anybody here in DC or even online um, involved with programs that are happening either around the Olympics or activities around the Olympics here in the United States? Yes. Uh, can you just tell us just briefly what they are, if anything? Um, sure. Actually, you've mentioned a lot of them. I Anybody else? Oh, another hand. Yes. Hi, my name is Ayaka Oliva. I work at the Georgetown University for an international student office. Um, I just know that, not myself, but I know that the study abroad office has a program called study abroad and job search study abroad program for the, the master's students for both in the uh, industry master's program. And the spring break uh, study course is a plan to learn more about uh, the sports industry that we have done uh, for the master's Yeah, I mean, thinking about connecting with whether it's a local university or your alma mater even, um, might be doing something through study abroad or one of the departments. Um, because I think one of the things that JET alums can contribute is just their knowledge and awareness of Japan and Japanese culture. Um, help yourself or, you know, most people don't like to toot their own horns in this area, but I do think that you have skills and knowledge that a lot of people don't have. Um, and whether they're people who are actually traveling to Japan um, for the Olympics or people who are just curious about Japan in, uh, in and around and during the Olympics, I think whether it's connecting with your um, local JAA chapter, whether it's connecting with universities um, or colleges in your area, or simply in your communities, in your churches, in um, any types of um, other social groups that you're a part of. You know, I bet you, even if you just mentioned that you lived in Japan at sometime between May and September, people will have questions, you know? And so I think just presenting yourself as having some knowledge on this topic is a way, I think, for people to engage and support the Olympics. Um, and perhaps foster a little bit of that Olympic spirit here in the U.S. in the field. So. Any others that are doing points? Yes. I have some thoughts. I was trying to think, what would wow like Americans when I was thinking about Japan? Well, can we expect robots, a lot of robots? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, uh, I know I just put one on. Oh, one was robots. Uh, I will say yes to robots. <laughs> well, I've, I've heard, I don't know if these are just rumors, but I know there's plans to use some robots in some form at the Olympics. And then the other thing was, um, I don't know what are the dominant sports of the Japanese, other than ice skating, but I know it's summer games, so I don't know if they're going to have like ice skating, the, the male, top male. That's a, that's uh, that a great question. Strong. Which which sports are Japan's strongest uh, sports that we're looking forward to seeing? Um, I know you have a competitive baseball program. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain disciplines in track and field that the Japanese are very strong at. Mm -hmm. um, some of the combat sports, mm -hmm. you know, diving, and you have a strong team. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only ones I can think of right now. <laughs> 
Uh, it would probably, it's not going to be part of the Olympics on the official program. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a demo. Judo, Aikido, yeah. So I, I have a question. So for, this is especially for those of you who are very familiar with Japan. Um, and, you know, if people like Paige or others in the audience want to weigh in, feel free. But as Tokyo has prepared for the Olympics, um, I personally noticed a lot of changes occurring in the city, whether they're related to the Olympics or just coincidental. Um, I'm curious, what changes have you seen upon recent visits to Tokyo that seem reflective of preparation for the Olympics? I would say more English, especially in Tokyo, which as a um, a student of Japanese took me by surprise. And at, at one point I didn't like it because <laughs> I wanted to read Japanese and there was all this English getting in the way. But, but I think the fact that there is more English and when you're on the trains, you know, the, the train stations have those alphanumeric coding on them. It, it makes it a lot easier. So when I think about bringing my family to Japan who are not Japan, experts or have never been to Japan, I'm not freaking out about how are they going to navigate the city. I think, I think the use of the English language and, and uh, you know, there's Korean on there too, but, but specifically the English language I think is very, very helpful. Um, in fact, there is a colleague from the US EPA who's going to be going to Japan for the first time and is very uncomfortable at the thought of going to Japan. And this is an accomplished government employee and she is going to a conference in Sendai and will have to transit through Tokyo and and she keeps asking me what she's going to do what am I going to do I'm going to Japan and I said you, you'll be fine and you know then finally I had to tell her, oh there's a lot of English and she calmed down so I think it's the English that um, and people making the attempt to speak a lot more English um, I think that's That'll be very useful for people who don't speak, to foreigners who don't speak Japanese. I can speak to that a little bit, having lived in two cities prior to the games. And one example I'm thinking of specifically was when I was living in Rio, I would ride the subway every day and naturally the announcements were in Portuguese. And then about three days out from the Olympic games, all of a sudden they switched over to English. And so that was interesting. And I did notice some of that in Korea and Seoul at this, when I was there as well. So there's definitely, they, they flipped a switch and all of a sudden the city that you know becomes this new place that is just full of foreigners and welcoming to everyone. I feel like subways in Tokyo have done that either with announcements, uh, whether it's a signage or announcements or something. I don't know if that's just me imagining it, but um, that, and I will say that one thing that has changed too are um, uh, more accessible taxis, like taxis that fit people who are maybe bigger in stature, who have disabilities or just bigger luggage compartments, <laughs> like just with the expectation that there'll be more foreigners who aren't Japanese, who don't travel like Japanese. Um, I see a lot more of them on the streets of Tokyo um, in the last couple of times that I've been. Yeah, thank you. I think accessibility is a really good point because just in the past three years, I've seen such a big difference in accessibility, um, not just with the taxis, but also in terms of access elevators to subway stations, um, these things you can ride on with your wheelchair so you have to go upstairs. Um, I had never, I had not seen many of those in Tokyo previously. Um, I think also when it comes to the jet program in the past three years, they have increased the number of jets in Tokyo. Previously, there were no jets in mm -hmm. Tokyo. And I think that is, I believe, related to the Olympics. Oe-san, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> so um, they're related to the accessibility. So um, as we already know, uh, the, the Uber or Lyft now you can use the uh, smartphone to call the taxi mm -hmm. and uh, actually the, so the cost of the taxi be uh, much uh, cheaper than before like uh, for four dollars or five dollars oh, wow. uh, yeah for Olympic games yeah, to welcome the uh, guests from the, all over the world 
But how about the increase in JET program teachers in Tokyo? Is it related to the Olympics? Yeah. <laughs> so this is Meryl. She's the one of the JET program coordinators at the Embassy of Japan. So every contracting organization makes their own requests for JET. So there is no official mandate for JET, but I think a lot of contracting organizations definitely see JET as a useful part of supporting the English initiative. <coughs> Thank you. So we have another question from online, and it's it's somewhat tangentially related to this conversation, but I, I think it's important to to ask because it relates to this idea of people-to-people -people connections and JET alumni wanting to return to Japan and give back in some way. Um, the question is if you know of any volunteer opportunities for a traveler to Japan and how someone might go about learning about those volunteer opportunities. And if the panelists cannot answer this, we also are happy to take input from the audience here in Washington, D.C. Um, I don't know how this relates to timing because we are closer to the games, but I know, for example, we have a hospitality house, which is known as USA House, and a vast majority of other countries also will host a local hospitality house. And typically they hire volunteers who will come and support the operations, the daily operations of those homes. Um, the official Tokyo 2020 volunteer um, campaign has already been staffed. Um, those typically are done two years out, but those are the vast majority of volunteer opportunities for individuals um, during the Olympics and the Paralympics. But that's not to say that there aren't other organizations that are out there that are still looking for support. Um, and I'm not sure the question was limited to the Olympics. Um, so, Jay, thank you for your question. This is not really our area of expertise, uh, but if we do find of anything that we can share with you, we will share it with you virtually after the panel. Um, we have our last question online uh, that we'll take, and then we can probably take one more final question in person. Um, so we'll do the online one very, very briefly, and then we'll go to Dr. Akimoto. So uh, Gilbert asks, is US JETA or other JET program entities organizing or offering any cross-cultural resources for the upcoming Tokyo Olympic Games? And if so, what nature or type? Now, I can certainly answer on behalf of US JETA. We are a US-focused organization, and we're not planning on doing anything in Japan related to the Olymp Tokyo Olympic Games, but I would be interested to know if anyone can weigh in on whether other organizations such as the official JET program or um, the AJET Association of JET or um, any of the alumni associations in Japan are, the JET alumni associations in Japan are planning anything. Maya, did you have something? No. Meryl, do you know of anything in Japan? So Gilbert, I would recommend checking out AJET, the Association of JET, and seeing if they're planning anything local. Also check out um, JETA Tokyo and JETA Western Japan and see if they're organizing anything. All right, we're going to take our final question from Dr. Akimoto.
currently we don't have ambassador in Tokyo, so uh, are they going to be literally the ambassador of the uh, United States in Japan? So I think it's crucially important that uh, uh, they uh, uh, represent the country well, uh, in an individual way uh, as well as a collective way. Sure. Actually, it's interesting you say that because this topic came up this morning, not in relations to Japan, but to the 2022 games in China, um, because we're already getting a lot of questions related to um, the, the Winter Games in Beijing. But what we do for our athletes is there's uh, two opportunities where we engage them and provide information on the host country to where they're going to go travel and compete. Um, one of those is what we call our Team USA Welcome Experience. And that's an online platform that has already begun where the athletes are given information about um, sort of the political atmosphere, uh, the social issues that are currently important in the country, um, and then just other information that they need to know about. Because we want to make sure that one, that everything that they do, they know it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a microscope on them. And we want them to be safe. And then there's this whole governing body called the IOC, which has rules. And so we approach it more from um, there are certain things that you have to be aware of that you, if you're not, you could potentially violate, for example, marketing rules, which or rules against the big news right now is protest and politics in the Olympics. Um, so we don't address specific issues but we talk about it more generally in the sense of within the scope of the IOC rules that regulate the Olympics. And naturally some of that is going to touch on some of the social issues or the political environment. The last games where this came up was probably the Sochi Winter Olympics that took place in Russia because there were a lot of social issues and political issues that we wanted the athletes to be aware of. Um, and then the second part of that is when they arrive um, in Tokyo, we have what we call team processing, which is another welcome and experience. And we have more seminars where they are getting information about the local politics, about the situation on the ground. And then the final part of that is when they do check into the village, they do get a security briefing. And, and again, there's a lot of issues that come up that they're made aware of. Um, thank you very much. So we're just about out of time. I'd like to ask the panel if you have any final thoughts on how something like the 2020 Olympics goes beyond sports to make people to people connections. We'll start for, with Maya and then we'll go to David and Naharika. Um, hmm, I was not ready for this one. Um, I think, as it's been said, um, the Olympics um, provide the opportunity for new people to enter the relationship. Um, everybody has a different entry point to the U.S.-Japan relationship, uh, whether it's language, culture, manga, um, you know, heritage, whatever it may be. Um, all pathways are equally valid, um, and all people, I think, are welcome once they're here. And so I think um, events like this have the opportunity to showcase the relationship, um, to put it front and center in the minds of people and to bring new people in. And I think the more people that we have in, the future conflicts we can avoid um, and the stronger the relationship will be. So I'm excited. I had plans to go to the Olympics, but it did not work out for me and my family. Um, but I'm looking forward to, to watching everything live on TV. Um, sports is a, it's, it's a universal language. Um, they say there's two universal languages, music and sports. You don't need to know the notes to be able to listen and enjoy music. And the same thing with sports. You don't need to speak the same language. All you need is a ball or a stick and everyone can just follow along. So, you know, that's the great thing about the Olympics and the Paralympic Games is that individuals are going to be collectively in one space um, for an extended period of time. And you just see this natural association of people of all different backgrounds that come together surrounding this, these unified games. And I think Tokyo, just like a lot of other games are gonna bring more people together than divide them. And you know, I think that's why I work in this space. I mean, it's one of those very unique areas where individuals can come together for one collective purpose. Well, I don't know how, I, I feel like I'm the only one standing between everyone and, and the door, but um, I was reminded of 
you know, of course, I echo what Maya and um, David have said that this really provided us with an opportunity that wouldn't necessarily have occurred to us. And it was, it was the event itself and, and this opportunity for sports diplomacy through the arts. And, and I was reminded of, um, of a debate, you know, I used to be a debater when I was in junior high school and um, it was one of, one of the, the debates that I was in, I started with the UN preamble, the charter, um, the preamble to the UN charter, which said, if wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be established. And I think this gives us the opportunity to change minds, to bring people in along with us to another culture, another country, and, and have that continue, have that excitement continue. And in two years to China, and then two years, you know, to France, and then to LA, and wherever we're going, there, we're, we're creating these opportunities. And we hope to find ourselves back here talking about, you know, China and what we're going to do with US-Japan-China relations at some point, too. So I, I think it's important. I, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity personally. Bahia, thank you for asking me which was, hey, do you want to participate in this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Maya and David, it's been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers. All right, that is our program for tonight. We are now at ru we rush out of the space. So if you do want some more food or a drink or something, feel free to get it on your way out. Otherwise, have, otherwise have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.